He was born May the 5th, 1926. Mr. Herzog currently resides at 33514 Jefferson Avenue, St. Clair Shores, Michigan. My name is Dave Brusso and I will be the interviewer and Gary Miglia will be the videographer. Mr. Herzog, would you say for the record the branch of service that you served? Uh, the U.S. Army. That would be 36th Infantry Division, 143rd Infantry Regiment, Company 143rd, uh, and Company G of the. What uh, a memory! Of the infantry, I think I was. Can you tell me what your service number is? Well, it's 4484 is the last four numbers that was on our, but I can't tell you what the others were because that was stenciled on our clothing. Four five five eight three four four. I don't think I'll ever forget that without even thinking. Well, I didn't pay particular attention to it except <laughs> at my clothing at four four eight four hundred. I don't know what made me remember that, but that's, that's very good. <clears throat> Aren't you proud? Uh, I'm alive. I'll say that. Right. <laughs> Let's go back to high school. Mackenzie High School. Mackenzie High School. Now let's go back a little before that. You you were born in Proctor, Minnesota. I'm interested in how you got to Detroit. Well, I was born in Proctor, Minnesota. Uh, my dad was postmaster. Uh, Proctor, Minnesota was a little small little burg. It would be like Hamtramck and Detroit when mm -hmm. this was Proctor and Duluth, Minnesota. Or as the inhabitants used to say, Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> because they were primarily, there was a lot of uh, Swedish, Finlanders, Norwegians because of the, the very cold temperature, which yeah. I guess matched their natural residence. So I was so I'm a lot of there. With Finlanders up there in the northern part, oh, Michigan God. as well as. And they were, I was, uh, the birth was by a midwife instead of any hospital because, you know, it was quite elementary type of <coughs> medicine and everything back then. You had a brother and a sister? And an older <coughs> sister and a younger brother. Did either of them serve? No, no. Well, my sister wouldn't and couldn't, of course, they weren't, uh, unless she volunteered. And my brother was too young. He was uh, born three years well, in after the late me. 40s. By the time he was, yeah, he, he was uh, he was born uh, February 25th. So you didn't tell us how you got to Detroit yet. Well, my dad had a brother that was very uh, mechanically uh, gifted, and my dad was extremely mechanically gifted. So that the brother, Thomas, uh, they spelled it Herzog. We spelled it Herzog. And Herzog is the German spelling. And Hetz, it's pronounced Hetzel because the Z is harsh. So my dad decided since it was pronounced Hetzel, he put a T in it, make it make the English pronunciation sound like the German. The word means Archduke in German but that was a few hundred years ago. So... Uh, was there an attempt to get the, the German part of it out of the name? Well, I don't know how you get the German part out of the name or the mean, put the T in? I don't know. I, I've had several that purposely changed their name because of the German... Backlash? Backlash, uh, and no. I never... I was quite surprised to hear that, and I haven't heard it since, and I just wondered if maybe... No, no. That name is uh, uh, always Herzog or Herzog. So mm -hmm. that side of the name was Herzog, and our side was Herzog to comply with the German. So was it the auto industry that... Well, yeah, there was... He uh, came down and he got a, a, he had a street named Dexter. He had a house, and it had a big garage behind it for some reason, like maybe a three-car garage mm -hmm. or whatever. Somebody might have had a lot of cars. So in that three-car garage, he built a little machine shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, uh, 
fellow working for him in the machine shop called Wilson. I remember because I remember Wilson. And he had more work than they could do. So then he wrote my dad to come down. And my dad would have liked to have stayed and been postmaster, but they had a problem with keeping track of stamps and money. And my dad, no matter how hard he tried, couldn't find out where the shortages were going. So finally he uh, advised them he was leaving, quitting, but he had to make up, he had to pay them money in spite of getting his wages for the shortages, because that's mm. your responsibility when you're mm. the postmaster. So then we came down and <clears throat> we were just, you know, little kids, and in fact, they left me with my grandma up there. <laughs> they came down and I stayed up with my grandmother, and uh, <clears throat> went, started school up there, uh, and uh, froze my butt off, terribly cold <laughs> up there, and eventually why well, they came and got me. Broke my grandma's heart, but I imagine was getting out of here. I, so imagine. I got back to uh, Detroit. I was how, how old would you have been then? Underweight, maybe six or seven. Oh my! Tremendously underweight. Wow! And I had a lot of lot of problem because it was drinking raw milk right out of the cow. It wasn't pasteurized, oh. so then you get worms and you get other stuff, and so. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, gave me some awful tasting medicine, and that went away. <laughs> And then I went to school here, but I never knew my name was Murdoch. Hmm. Never. What did you go by? And, and, well, James was my middle name. Okay. So I was Jimmy or James. And How did you get the name Mickey? Well, when I was in the service, when I put the helmet liner on, I was a spinning image of Mickey Rooney. Right? Ah! And I couldn't get away from it. it I'll be darned. Just be him. People would see me and say, Mickey Rooney! And so my actual nickname was Bubs, B U B S. Bubs. So it was, it was, certainly wasn't Mickey. And so then, of course, uh, I couldn't get away from it. So pretty soon it was just Mickey and I'd answer to it. And then, of course, a uh, one time Mickey Rooney came over to check on me. Really? Yeah. Me? <laughs> we got back off the lines and. R and R, which is you know, they call it rest and retreat, but it wasn't rest and retreat. We just went back. You, you got, to, you took all. You know, get away from the combat line. I came off the line, brought the whole group back in six buys, and then you, uh, you got in line, and as you went down the line, you got rid of all your clothes, and you were walking around carrying your shoes. Every piece of clothing come off you. Then you went through and you had to go up, put your shoes down, and then you went around this way, and so you'd come back to your shoes. And when you went through there, you were going through a shower, and then close your eyes and mouth, and they sprayed this white stuff on yeah. you. <laughs> I guess something to do with the lice or whatever the heck it Sterilization was. Sterilization process. And yeah, then you went a, 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 a little further, and they had quartermaster, you know with all your clothes and say what size you're wearing and say yeah. what's in and they give you the pants and the shirt and the undershirt or t-shirt and socks and, and that betches you go put yourself back on, go get your shoes, put them on. It's a fresh start. Did, did you enlist or did you? Oh no, I was in my high school graduating class. I wasn't about to enlist. I weighed 128 pounds by either 126 or 128. I know that because when they drafted us, uh, you appeared in front of a board and there was three people there. Uh, one, two, three. And my dad was a chief petty officer and the quartermaster. And uh, he said, you just tell them Navy. You tell them Navy. Tell them I was a chief petty officer. You, you be in a ring. And he standed at attention. Follow his instruction, you know. Get down there and I'm standing there. And the guy said, what service would you like to be in? I said, well, I have to be in the Navy. My dad was Chief Petty Officer Quartermaster. The Navy guy says, great. When did you graduate? I said, sir, they took me out of my graduating class. I didn't graduate. He said, oh, we can't take you then. 
And the green guy says, I'll take him. And I looked at that green guy and said, you know what happened if I come home and told my dad I was in the Marines? I said, I don't know if I'd let me in the house. And the Army guy says, I got him. That's strange, because the Army and Navy did a lot of things together. Not then. <laughs> not, not out then, you know, maybe. <laughs> back then, it was where the need was. I'm sure they needed to be Next done. week, the Navy would have jumped all over you, depending on what they needed. And, okay. uh, so, so anyway, going through the, the, the physical. Why did they take you out of high school? Well, no. And you were close to graduation. That was my graduating class. Mm -hmm. That would take somebody with more knowledge than mine. Yeah. I was... Again, it goes back to need and... I've been 18 three months. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, oh. going through the, the thing I got on the scale, now first of all, they make you take all your clothes off. Every bit. So you start naked and you're walking through there. And I remember this big sergeant said, come here, get on there. And I got on the scale and he tipped it up. It was 126 or 128, whatever it was. And he looked at me and he said, when are they going to send the rest? <laughs> <laughs> and I jumped off that scale and I says, come on, you big <laughs> And he said, get out of here. <laughs> you, you made it then. Oh, that was... So I, like you said, I got to. And then they had the psych one, which is, you want to hear this? I want to hear what you want to tell me. Well, they brought us, we're in a line and they bring us over to the Sheets are blocking off the whole area, and there's a doorway through, and there's a guy there. We lined up, and when he got there, he'd say, go to number four, go to number three, go to number two. So I got there, and I don't remember number four or whatever, and he says, go to number four. So you look, and there's these signs hanging out with the numbers on them, and there's little cubicles that they've created. And when you got there, you turn in, and there was a desk, and a guy sitting behind it, and you come in here, and there's a chair there. You're stark naked. <laughs> so he's fully dressed with a white coat and everything. So I sit down there, and he, and he leaned over, and he put his hands up my knee and oh. said, how's it going? <laughs> and I said, you take your hand off my knee, I'll break your goddamn head. <laughs> so you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> So I guess that was some kind of whatever it was. Now, we skipped over it, but you referred to your mother as mom. My mother, yeah, Mars, Marceline. What, what was that like when you got oh, when drafted? They got, when they got the note, well, it wasn't bad getting drafted, but when, with these new, when I came home with the news I was in the Army, it was not pleasant. You know, he, he did not like Army, my dad. What about your mom? Though? Well, they didn't like me being drafted because you know there was a war on, and uh, my dad worried. knew. My dad pretty well, of course, had been in the navy for a while, and he pretty well, well had it figured out that I'd be in the army and I'd be a dog face. You know, there's no question because you know I didn't have, didn't get out of high school. Mm -hmm. So, and he didn't like that either because he knew I would be, you know, what they call the cannon fighter. Baby. Were you a good student? I, while I was, school was easy. Well, I had a, I've always had, only recently has it slacked off a bit, but I always had a phenomenal memory. Phenomenal. I just never knew it. No, you know, you don't realize it until right. later. Compared to? Yeah, because somebody would say no, and I'd say, oh, no, 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 that's, that, oh, there you go. And I would even sometimes quote the page, which would whew, get them excited. Mm. But I, that, that made that easy. But, you know, my mom and dad didn't like my going in at all. I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get in there. But, bang, bang, I was gone. They Where said, did you go first? I well, the, well the, Boot? when they sent you to, uh, through that physical exam and everything, then you got a, a, a number and a, they give you some information and you, I think they wanted you to call in every day, something like that. Anyway, I was told, go. And uh, you went down to Michigan Central, which was operating at that time. You get on a train and you go to 
I think it was Chicago. And out of Chicago, whoop, I wound up in uh, Camp Wheeler, uh, Georgia. <clears throat> I remember the signs on the, the uh, doors, no, no dogs, no soldiers. We were second class to dogs. Which yeah, Newport, Rhode Island was dogs, cats, and sailors stay off the grass. <laughs> Real friendly. Well, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that. that was kind of strange. Uh, we were riding back in the bus uh, going back to Camp Wheeler because they'd take a bus, they'd take us into Macon, Georgia. We're coming back from Macon, Georgia, going to camp. And of course, the bus has got a lot of uh, northern people. I didn't see any southerns, you know. We're trading in, training in Georgia. I didn't see any southerns that I can remember. But we're going along, and this bus driver, it's night, and this bus driver, and there's a black soldier out there. And he's waving for the bus to stop. And the guy's driving, this southern bus driver's driving by. Whoa! <laughs> we didn't, that didn't happen. Not only did we holler, we got up. Stop, and this guy got the idea. Back the bus up. Got Interesting. The yeah, they, they were bad down there. Who? Six, eight, ten weeks? Uh, I think the boot camp was longer. I'm going to say 12, 14 weeks maybe. That's they were rushing. Like I remember. They were rushing it, and they were uh, putting a lot of pressure on. You know, and we'd be up. Man, it'd still be dark. Well, you know, it's August of '44. We're getting ready for our eventual landing. Well, of course, I wasn't in, into any of that. All I was right on uh, the East Coast. I mean, on the Pacific side, we we got to be damn close to the final stretch into Germany on on the European side. So the rush is probably anticipating what's going to happen. I think they'd already had their landing. They were already moving through France. the landing, but the final rush because you're now. You're now past uh, what's what's that last big battle? The no. bunker battle of the bulge. Battle of the bulge. Up. No, no, that, that's, that's coming up. That's well, right. That's that was early '45, right? That's coming up. So anyway, then they I get Thanksgiving and then I don't know there's some holidays, but anyway, all of a sudden I was over in a big boat, big boat, and I'm not a boat person at that <laughs> stage. But this thing was a block long. <laughs> and, uh, Just a troop was, ship? It was a troop ship. So as soon as I hit the troop ship, I had noticed all the, f the uh, irritation and complaining about doing KP yeah. as I was going through uh, boot camp and going through the training. So, uh, I figured there's going to be a lot of complaining about that too. So as soon as I got my assignment, I headed for the galley. That's where you get a job helping out the. So I walked in. And I said, "Chief, guys, you're going to have to cook for a lot of people. Can I help?" And these sailors, chefs, were astounded. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I said, "Whoa, yeah, you want to help? Sure. Well, great, great. Come over here and peel these potatoes." So they had this big thing of potatoes. And they had this, you know, so I'm peeling the potatoes away. And I did that for an hour and a half or two hours, maybe. And then in comes some buck sergeant with a bunch of guys, I think four or five, and he says, Hey, they're here for KP, they'll help you out. And the, the Navy guy that was, I said, Well, thank you very much. Uh, hey, uh, you. <laughs> yes, sir. You're in charge. Give these guys things to do. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So I got. Now this is a difficult part of the war. Uh, scared? No. I wasn't scared. So anyway, we finally make the journey, and we. Now you've never been aboard ship before. No. That didn't bother you. Yeah. Didn't the bother. ocean didn't bother you. No, it was a little rough. Sometimes the guys would get seasick. <laughs> 
they're all lined up to get the food, and we got this, these big cans with the tops on them. And uh, they're coming down the line. I lift it up and you know, let the steam go away, and then they yeah. dip, dip up on the bowl or whatever the, what it had been. And, this, and I look back, three or four people, and there's a guy who looks green. So when his turn come, I got this lid and I'm holding it, <laughs> I'm holding it down. <laughs> and when he got the right front, I dipped it up like this, and I fumed it. He Coffee was, and crackers. He was gone. Coffee and saltine crackers. They would have to, uh, they would, they have to regurgitate. It was made very clear. You regurgitate in your helmet lighter. You do not. Anybody else? You do not <laughs> sully the ship. Oh, he had his helmet lighter <clears throat> off front. I got that. Was... When you sit at the table with these ten oversized plates, it's like one of these plates you buy in the store, and it's got sections in it. Well, this was a tin with sections in it. Oh yeah, Quick, you could carry it. To keep your plate from sliding, they had this white, really white bread. You put two or four slices down and then you press it and it sticks to the table. And your <laughs> we table... Never, we never had that Your kind table of pan wouldn't move when you're going like this. We never went like that. That was a big ship, that thing. Very... That little subtle rock, though, was what bothered yeah. a lot. It didn't bother me, but it bothered a lot. You're me. lucky it's better than this kind of rock. Oh, yeah, was that the subtle rock? So eventually we landed, I, I think it was La Havre, France. And I, you know, I'm still a kid and I'm looking at all the movement hmm. trucks, people, <coughs> things going here. Then you see bombed out areas. I had not seen bombed out areas before. So a bombed out area. So then they, you know, you're up there and they call your name and you go and they get on a six by with a bunch of other guys. And uh, you're on your way to a repel devil. Replacement devil. We call them repel devils. Replacement depots. And the, uh, you have the third army. 7th Army, you know, these armies, and then you had the divisions, and they would request men as guys were uh, killed or wounded, and replace, you would be the replacement. So all of a sudden, um, I hear my name called, okay, I go up and I'm with, you know, a bunch of other guys, maybe a dozen, and they pile us in this, uh, this was, this was, uh, if it was a six by, it was modified because it had benches. The other times, it's just a plain truck and you can get a lot of men in there. And you're cheek to jowl, you know. And you, everybody wants to be on the outside to hang on, but everybody can't be. Cause... So that's what I'd see. So we sat down and they drove us to an area in France and uh, I, I think one of the guy, or maybe me, or maybe just myself, think he said over there. So you know you're carrying your bag because you got your stuff in it, clothes and stuff. And uh, I went over there, and it was Company G, 143rd Infantry Regiment, 36th uh, Texas Division. So the sign was an arrowhead. I think there's one in there. Arrowhead, blue with a T for Texas in it. It was Texans, through and through. So uh, I go over there, report there, and uh, the guy's looking at me and I'm looking at him. He's pretty big, I'm still pretty small. Although I've been eating food and it, it was beefing me up and then all the running and stuff that we were doing in the training, so I was beefing up a bit. But he said, okay, what's your name? And I said, to him, you know, Murdoch. So, okay, private, come here. So he goes over there and he says, I want you to meet this guy, this guy, this guy. These are the guys in charge. You know what a private is? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I know what a private is. <laughs> the bottom of the ladder. So uh, we're, we're getting ready to move out. And I said, okay. Didn't you know, know where you're going? Yeah. Private doesn't have the faintest idea where they're going. Or does he, I don't know whether he gives a crap or not, I do. So 
So anyway, why well, uh, we get all set and they bring us up, drop us off, and we uh, spread out and start forward. And we got to wherever they wanted us to be, which I haven't the faintest notion where that is or what it is. And this we're, we're setting up here. The only thing I noticed was there was open space in the direction we were heading, and there were uh, houses or places you could barns you could go inside because it was cold. This is uh, the December, Winter. January. Yeah, yeah. And that would have been 44, 45. Exactly. So it's cold. So um, they, I'm the low run on the ladder, so I'm going to pull a four-hour shift at night. I don't know what it was. 12 to 4, whatever it was. It was at night, dark, dark night. So I'm out there with an M1 sitting in a foxhole that I helped dig. And uh, I remember the, the water froze around my boots. And my water, water froze around my boots, but I didn't, I didn't notice it. <laughs> and man, I was, whoa, whoa, looking for crops. Any inkling as to where you are in the war and whether you're on oh, the west? Southern France, Southern France. Yeah, yeah. But, but would you at that time know that you're now getting into the final stages? Oh, no. No? No, no. Crops were shooting. Yeah, as long as they're shooting, it's still going on. But, and initially you're dealt with the Wehrmacht. You didn't deal with the folks army, or whatever they call them, you know, when they start pulling. They didn't start pulling the Wehrmacht out until toward the end, and then they put them over, get them over into Russia, stop the Russians. But then, why it was a Wehrmacht, they were, they were good. So I'm sitting in the hole watching, and then finally the four hours are up, and the guy comes, and he makes sure that you know he's coming. <laughs> <laughs> he one of his buddies shooting at him. <laughs> then you could, of course, you could hear him. You know, he did quiet at night. So comes up, and I was glad to get the hell out of there. So. And you're still not scared, huh? Mm -hmm. You're still not scared, huh? No, at that point, I wasn't too scared. I mean, nothing had happened. Nobody had shot at me yet. Or mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't seen a crowd. So I get up and go back in, and then eventually now we move, we're moving up again. Now we start having contact with the Krauts. Now it's a different ball game, because we're taking some casualties, they're shooting at us, and we're shooting back, and uh, it got a little sticky, a little bit tough. And uh, I was small, so I was, I was easy to conceal. <laughs> These big bulky guys, they, they, I could get in a, a plowed furrow and be out of sight. But not those guys, because I, I was still small. They ever teach you how to fight that way? I mean, you're going in and there's a lot of uh, furrows, a lot of bushes, rows of bushes, and you know, you go up and down on the bushes so you can't really see people hiding. They do not. That is all self-taught, but they do yeah. teach you to uh, how to handle the gun. I mean, they sure learn quick, but they, just, they teach you how to handle the gun, and then of course you got to use your common sense. So things uh, were going along pretty good, and then we had a uh, incident where uh, they're going to. Uh, by now, I've had a some experience and, and uh, lost either one or two lieutenants by then. And uh, they give us a guy named Stanley Pleasant, very nice gentleman. He's a lieutenant, brand new, replacing our lieutenant. And uh, he's six months older than I am. <laughs> I'm a PFC and he's a Green Lieutenant, which is called a Second Lieutenant. And uh, he wanted to know, you know, he was he was uh, smart enough to 
to know we had been doing this a while, and he hadn't. So he very definitely said, you know, hey, you guys have to do something, you tell me. And he and I are friends till today. But he wasn't with me very long. Because they uh, give him orders, we're supposed to go along this road, when we get to a certain point, we spread out, we're supposed to go up this hill, and then it flattens out. And there's a little dwarf or town over there that we're supposed to take, we'll take that town. Immediately, I don't like walking up an open field. There's woods here. The woods go all along our right side, and then they have a corner, and they turn and go toward the town. So we're in this, as far as I'm concerned, and I want to tell him, I don't, you know, just go in here. But his orders go up there. Well, I do not like it. Uh, and then there's another platoon that's going to follow us up. So we start up the hill and everything is fine. It's such a plowed field, you know, crossways to us. We start, as soon as we get in the flat area where that woods is on the same level, the woods going across our front is on the same level, a machine gun opens up and pins us on our butt down in the dirt. In the meantime, that town has got a steeple in the church and there's a shouldn't say goddamn but there's a sniper there and he's shooting and he shoots the lieutenant through the leg and misses the bone um, once I hear the machine and I hear the sniper go up and hear somebody holler I get up and I run to, to the woods to my right and the machine gun opens up and I drop down. I had a pack on, he shot through the pack. But he didn't get me. That's a pretty good shot, too. Well, he could get down, but that's as far as he could yeah. get down with the gun for this machine gun. So I wait and I hear that sniper pop again. And then I hear the machine gun open up over here where somebody moves. So I'm on my way again and I'm thinking to myself, you know, as soon as he starts shooting, drops. So as soon as our debris, I was in the dirt, and that time I was down far enough. He didn't get it through me. Uh, he didn't get through my pack. And then I wait. He waits. I hear that sniper again, and then I hear him over there. And this time I run when he starts shooting. I don't give a darn. I'm run in the woods. As soon as I'm in the woods, I run like hell up there, and then I run across, and I wait. And I hear him again. And I run up in the sound and I'm right behind him and I put the tree the rifle over and I said hand a hoe and some other bad words and they look back and of course the M1 you know it's not a bold action you pull the trigger so they knew bang 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 so right away it was hands a hoe and I come here and they came over and uh, I don't know if one had a pistol or not but uh, and I'm down, and they laid down, and I ran out, and I waved at the guys to get off the field. You know. So the guys got off the field, and I took the three krauts, and we went back to the woods, and back to the woods over here. And we got back there, and the guys were gathering around, and I said, where's, where's the lieutenant? He's over there. So I walk over there, and here's the lieutenant, and he's got a bullet wound in his leg, as I said, did didn't hit the ball, and I said, you got a gift. He couldn't quite Comprehend pick that. upon that. <laughs> but he caught on, and he says, what do you want me to do? And he still remembers to this day that I told him, why don't you just hold up this tree? <laughs> and I turned around, and I walked back with the group, and I want to get this, one of the wounded guys off, the, because he's moving around to get him off the hill. So I have the guy, come on, everybody, shoot in that steeple. So some of the guys are grabbing the M1s and are pop popping away at the steeple and getting that goddamn sniper out of there. So then I go up and I send the three guys out to pick up the wounded guy, and the guys below start shooting at him. So the crowds come running back to me and I step out and I get out. 
So then that was the second group behind us. So they got off the field to went into the woods. And uh, we picked the guy up. We, we got, they got the guy off the field. He'd been shot right through the face. Mm. Right, to, Ooh. right to the face. Sniper was a good shot. Yeah. He killed Vino Ray, the guy that had been there for, forever. Killed him. He got Vino Ray, and I guess he got maybe got one other guy. He got Vino Ray. And uh, so anyway, somewhere they, when that group was below us, somebody picked up a litter. You know, a litter you carry like this. You put the guy in. They brought that up. So we had the German guys put a, put the uh, wounded kid like me in the in the litter. And then I'm talking to everybody because we have to take that town. And so I'm setting up like, okay, as a BAR, you're going to take a BAR and you're going to go to the end here and you, you're a good shot. You go with them. Anybody comes out of that village when we start moving around and flushing it, you pin them in. They either surrender or die. And I'm talking, and then this other group comes up and the lieutenant comes up and he says what are you doing with your men sergeant huh. I'll look around huh. you mean me and he says yep I said I'm a PFC he says, what huh. where's your sergeant and I says I'll get you sergeant sir so I holler moody moody this was a Texas unit 100% Texans Moody was the only Texan left. Mm -hmm. A buck sergeant. He was the only Texan left. <coughs> and every time the shooting would start, or anything would start, he had an M1 like we all did, and you have a leather strap and there's a metal buckle here. And he'd start shaking that metal buckle and he'd go, bah, 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 bah. drive you crazy. So I said, Moody, this lieutenant wants to talk to you. So Moody goes up to the lieutenant and says, Yes, sir. What are you going to do with your men? Moody looks at him. Mickey, what are we going to do with our men? I says, okay, Moody, you go on the back. Watch the back. Make sure they don't get us from back. Because <laughs> that's what I always did with Moody. If I had anything to say about it. So Moody hiked to the back. And so this lieutenant says, well, I don't know what your rank is, but these guys listen to you, so I guess you're in charge. I says, thank you, sir. And what are you going to do? So I explained to him. So I said, you got to, if you got a BAR, we'll put two BARs over there. We don't have to worry about a rifleman. We can use Was them. he still able to walk? Moody? No, the lieutenant. No, the lieutenant. Well, this is a lieutenant from the group oh, below. Oh, the new one that had come in. Yeah, he's from that platoon below us that came up. He's got men. And none of his men got it. Because we were the first wave. First wave. So... Uh, I said, put two BARs there, we can use everybody to move, we'll go across. Looks to me like, you know, a few streets we can run through and clean them out. But in the meantime, they're having a big argument. Nobody will take that wounded guy back because you've got to go through a minefield. See, we skirted the minefield. We came over here. But you, this guy's wounded. He's got to go there mm -hmm. to the road. You can't go over there and then way back over there. So I get a little bit disgusted about it, and I, uh, okay, I'll take it. So me and the three crowds start, and we're walking through, and you could see the pins sticking up because it had been yeah, like, it had three been, or four little hair three, pins almost, three, just like yeah. that. And the rain had settled down, so we could see him. We're picking our way through him, and the, the poor goddamn crowd soldier had diarrhea. So I'd have to hold the end up, and he'd just step over, pull his pants on, go to the bathroom, pull his pants up, didn't worry about wiping or anything like that, and then he'd back up there. And so we finally got to uh, the road, carrying it, and they had a jeep with the rigs on the back, so you could put the litter on it, and then the jeep would take them to the hospital or wherever. 
So um, got down there, put the uh, litter on the jeep, and it was getting dark. I know where I'm, you know, I sure ain't going back to that minefield in the dark or wandering around. So there was a barn there. So I went, found the barn, and uh, climbed up in the hayloft and went out like a light. Uh, I heard noise and, and light in the morning that woke me up. And so I crawled back down out of the uh, hayloft and uh, there's soldiers there. So I come out, you know, and I said, uh, where's Company G? I don't know. So I said, well, okay, so I retraced my steps, only I don't go through the minefield. <laughs> None of that foolishness. I went down around, went up through the woods, went to that small town, GIs, but not us. And I said, you know, where the company? Where they went. And they said, well, I think they went up here. So it took uh, the better part of that day to find Company G because they had advanced and moved up. And I was reported as uh, MIA. Missing in action. Missing in action, yeah. And they were surprised to see me when I showed up. Said, uh, one of the guys said something about bad dogs don't die or something. <laughs> Some remark he made. So how far are you from Germany now? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, haven't the faintest. I remember the hag in all woods. Hey, wait a minute. You've just been put in charge, Private. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the shooting starts. <laughs> Up to then it's, you know. Although, you know. So, we're uh, going to go move up and we're going to take another town or area. <clears throat> I don't know if that was, we were in Germany now or not, but I do remember they were going to give us tank help. <clears throat> you guys are lucky, we're going to give you tanks. You know, because there's some uh, mechanized, mechanized forces there. <clears throat> well, I said, okay. So we go through the woods and we wind up, and there is a <clears throat> swampy area, <clears throat> quite a, l a large swampy area, and uh, with two, like, nobody wants to go across it, that's for sure, but the Germans, or French, whoever they were, had built a road, <clears throat> maybe a hundred yards, football field, my guesstimate now looking back, and it was built up, and it was a road. Obviously traffic could ride back and forth, it was to get through that uh, soil, the swamp and stuff, <clears throat> and you could see the town over there. So we're going to have tank help, oh that's great. So we're all ready, we're there. And when the tanks go by, we're going to fall in behind them and start walking behind the tanks as they lead the way. So the three tanks go, the first tank goes across, second tank goes across, third tank goes across. And as soon as that third tank got uh, sufficiently far <clears throat> from the woods, the protection, you heard that cannon go off. <clears throat> hit that tank dead center. Mm. And then boom, another round took the front tank out. And that middle tank turned and went right off the road mm. into the swamp. <clears throat> uh, well, of course, a bit of a surprise to us, to say the least. <clears throat> First of all, we couldn't see what the hell was shooting at us seemed to come from the left corner up there. So, uh... That could have been a long way away, too. Didn't sound a long way. It sounded to me like it was right there. And my ears were good on where things were at that time. So, um... Nobody's moving, and I said, come on, guys, come on, come on, come on, and nobody's moving, and that... Hmm. The guy in charge isn't... They replaced him with a guy from New York. 
lieutenant. He was scared to death every uh -huh. minute. So I said, I said, okay, okay. I said, uh, uh, give me the bazooka and arm it. Now, you know, you got to put the bazooka in and you got to hot wires on and that crap. And the guy with the bazooka, he wouldn't move it. So he gave me the bazooka and he said, I can't arm it because if he put it in, the thing will fall out. He said, well, here's what you do. And he showed what you do. And I said, okay. So I put the bazooka around in my belt, hanging down. <clears throat> And I take off down the road, and I get to the side away from where the shooting was, and I get to the first tank, and this uh, guy crawls out, and uh, so I he's crawling out of the bottom of the tank, and I'm reaching over, pulling him to get him down, you know, off the road, out of line of fire, because they're shooting at a machine gun every once in a while. Um, and I said, what about the others? And he said, gone, 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 gone. That's all he would say, gone, gone, gone. I said, okay. Go up to the middle tank. Those guys are all, you know, climbing out of the tank because they went over the side and they were <clears throat> not hurt. And every once in a while I pick my head up and look over the top of the road at the, to see what's going on. And I'd open up with the machine gun. So then I begin to get an idea of where they were at. So I drop down, I go further, and I pick up, and they'd open up again. And I saw they were in the right where the road ended, and the other road came. They were in a pocket right there. <clears throat> so I keep going along, peeking, and I get to that uh, first tank that got hit. Two of those guys are still alive. The one guy was at Pyramid Bottom. He's, you know, a gun go, boat, shell goes off, and you're in there. You better believe he's in trouble. So he's out of it, but the other guy is wounded, but he's walking with it. So I'm telling him to stay down, go back here. <laughs> so meanwhile, I'm peeking over again. Now, <laughs> whoever they are over there, they see me. Now I'm getting pretty damn close. And I'm poking up, and uh, I hear a, 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 an engine start. It was a self propelled. You hear that diesel, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a self propelled, <clears throat> and it's uh, an 88 which is a gorgeous, gorgeous weapon, and a machine gun. So there's looked like to me like two or three guys on there, uh, <clears> three, <throat> three, because they have the steering the guy and the gun the And uh, he <laughs> pulls out of it. They had dug it out, and, and that SB, that self propelled, had backed in there, and that he had been able to zero in his gun while they were waiting. So he he got got up on the road, and I'm not going to shoot a bazooka, damn thing that I don't even know what's there as a proper. So I get the rifle over and I'm popping him a few rounds. He turns around with the machine and I said that ain't a good idea. <laughs> so he left, and when he took him, he went down and he went up one of those streets in, the, in that town, that little town there. So then I got up on the road and I couldn't see anybody. So then I'm leaning over to the guy, come on, come on. So then everybody came on. So then when we came across, uh, we went to the town, which was a little to the, to the left, and they had a graveyard. So we're all ducking behind the gravestones. You know. So I'm going to go see what's down the street. You know, cause. So I go over and I stick my head off, look down the street. <laughs> There's a Tiger Roy L sitting at the end of the street with his gun like that, facing down the street. I see him. <laughs> he sees me. I'm smart. I run. <laughs> and he just swings the gun around and blows the corner of the building off. Roy just took my piece. Blew the corner of the building. I'm back behind the graves. Like, Holy shit. It's a Tiger Royale. The story about the Tiger Royale is sort of humorous. Because before, when we were moving uh, a couple of times through these woods and everything, I saw a tread. It was a big tread, you know, over here. And I'm looking at the tread, and I'm looking, and I can't see another tread. So I turned. One of the guys that says, Jesus Christ, they got a single tread vehicle. 
he seen tanks he'd been there a little longer than I and he said oh, oh yeah oh yeah come here come here and he takes me we go way over there and there's the other train you know the American tanks American tanks now look like the Tiger Royal that Germans had a tank event you had to pick a spot to hit it because everything was armored mm. and it took a lot of diesel fuel but anyway he's there we have to get rid of him shooting small arms at him ain't going to do it. But we have some phosphorus grenades. If we can get close enough to lob a phosphorus grenade out of him, he's out of there. Because the phosphorus, you know, burns and it's, it goes through all the cracks and crannies. Makes life very miserable. Well, okay, how do we do that? So we're talking and I said, okay, um, you three guys. When I say run, run across the street, fast as you can. They won't be able to get a range on you, do anything by that time. And when you get that, walk down. We'll go up this side, you go up that side, and be careful. Try to listen where the tank is. Don't be letting yourself be seen. So, boom, they run across in that machine gun. Well, it's, you know, they're, they're. So they're moving up and we're moving. So they decide they're going to peek out and look to see where the tank is. I said to go up, Jim. But one of them has to, you know. So he's about two thirds of the way up. And he goes in a house, he goes up the second floor, and he goes over and he looks out the window to see where the tank is. The tank guy sees him, that cannon goes, they bail out of the house. He blows the top of the house off. He's right. Of course, I heard that, and I'm back over here. I want to get close enough so I can go in and he's there. I don't want to let him, you know. But he doesn't like that coming up, because he's as much aware of phosphorus grenades as we are. So when he saw that there, he knows we're moving through the town. Uh, the, the, the Panzer uh, soldiers were elite. They were elite. Highly trained, competent, smart. So, oh, you hear the roar of that engine, you'll never forget it. You, it's a massive engine. That engine started up. And then we all just stopped and waited to see where he was going. So, you could hear him, he backed up, and then you hear him going. Whoosh. Meanwhile, as soon as he came that way, these guys all went and hid. And he went shh up and then he turned and went up somewhere and we could hear him. So then we all come piling out and going through the town and we didn't, very little resistance, everything was moving away from us to get the hell away from us. And so we got to the uh, end of the town and when we got to the uh, end of the town, uh, the uh, lieutenant was setting up a, a, a CP there. You know, we were all there, and uh, it was getting dark. And uh, I used to carry the the radio, which was the big 300. You know, and most of the guys that carried that radio got shot because the radio would constantly static and it make noise. Bacon. And uh, so I discovered right off the bat when it was making noise to reach back and pull it in a little, broke the connection or something, shut up. Why? So I didn't mind carrying it. And when the lieutenant would want it, I'd reach back because I took it off and smacked the antenna back in. Well, he could not communicate with anybody below us. And he was on there talking and talking. The battery was up just couldn't do it. And that's, the next morning he wants to make contact. It's foggy. It's a nice town, nice houses. So we had a sergeant that joined us, I think his name was DeSalvo. And he told DeSalvo to go hook up with whatever unit is most and find out what's going on and tell them the radio was working or whatever. So DeSalvo says, I'll go if you give me Mickey. 
guy says, you got him, Mickey. And so I give the readers something we go through. It's foggy. And it's, you know, the sun is not good. It's foggy and it's you know, still dust. There's still daylight coming. And we're going down this wood and all of a sudden I hear something. So there's these wooden posts by a gate there. So he gets behind one post, he gets behind the other post. And I holler out, who is there? Who are you? Who are you? Who is there? And then he holler, who wants to know? <laughs> you know? And I said, look, if you're American, quit bullshitting. <laughs> I said, out of it, this guy. And he says, no bullshitting. He says, come on, but get your hands up. So I fling the rifle over your shoulder, you know, like this. You know? So we walk, and there's a bridge. They had set up a line on that side of the bridge. Figuring there weren't too many crooks going to go. The crowd's going to go. You know. So we walk over and thank them. Hi, all right. Okay. And uh, so they bring us to their uh, setup, their CP, uh, or their lieutenant is. And I tell them, Lieutenant so and so can't, the radio don't work. He wants to know what to do. And. Uh, the other guy, he gets on his radar, works perfect. And he reaches regiment, regiment says, well, gives some instructions, you know. Okay, move up and hold at a certain point. So he, by now we're getting daylight. But interestingly, before we got to the bridge, he and I start walking through the town, and all of a sudden, you see silhouettes coming <laughs> through the fog. You know, three of them. So he and I the gun and we're watching and waiting and these guys come up you know they got the hat with the shading brush you know in the thing up here and that stuff and they come walking up good good morning and <laughs> they think we're German soldiers <laughs> until they get close and when they get close their eyes get big and they're standing there like frozen in time it's just two of us, you know. So we put the guns away, and then I go to the to the to the, to the guys that are there, and they're just not saying a word. And I had learned to say to your cellar, Zoo Keller, go get him. So I learned that because one of the guys could speak German fairly decent. So I said, Zoo Keller, gay and yeah, yeah, and ping. <laughs> So we get our instructions, we walk back and uh, tell the, this lieutenant and uh, somehow, uh, I think the other unit joined us or they sent a runner or somebody with another radio that, that worked. We got that radio. Now we're moving up again. We're, now we're definitely in Germany. And we're going along and all of a sudden we're stopped. And we make a flanking move. Instead of going forward, we turn around, we all go way over to, to I think the far left. And then we almost like single file. We come and then we come back this way. And the reason we did that flanking move is because they had pillboxes mm -hmm. set up facing that direction, you know, with slots, slots, and slots. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many there were, but they were there, so the area we come in, we're behind a pillbox. So I'm minding my own business, which I found out a long time ago was a good way to be. And these guys are trying to get the krauts out of the pillbox. And uh, they're throwing grenades in. And the grenade goes up, and the Germans would fire up a burst through the door. Don't come in. I'm minding my own business and I'm over here and all of a sudden, Mickey! Yes! How do we get him out of there? Give me a BAR. So they give me a BAR and I give my rifle. I hang the BAR like this because you can hang the BAR like this. Give me a grenade. So I take the grenade and dump the powder out. I want to make sure there's no powder in it. I don't want to blow it up when I'm running in. I put it back together, I pulled the pin, 
and I lean over and I throw the grenade in. <clears throat> you could hear the, the crowd out of grenade. <clears throat> You know, so then I run in, but I made a mistake because it was bright sunlight out here. And when, as soon as I run in, I couldn't see anything. I had to stop. And fortunately, before anything happened, my eyes adjusted to the light, and I could see the slots. And I had they had sandbags, sandbags stacked up as protection on each side, and they had a a bipod machine gun, which is just two like this, and, uh, sitting in the middle, and that's what they're reaching over and pulling a trucker on. So I'm now there with the BAR, now I can see, and all of a sudden the cross head pops up over the sandbag, and <laughs> looks at me, and I said, hands a hoe, and some other nasty stuff. And uh, his head pops down. And then I hear this conversation. I didn't know German. I learned to speak German fluently. Right then, I didn't know German, but I knew they're talking. And they can't get to that machine gun, you know. And I got to be it. All of a sudden, three of them. <laughs> so I said, "Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here." They come over, and these guys outside, said, "What's going on?" I said, "Be careful, wait." I want to shake down the three Germans, and I got a pistol. So I got a pistol out of one of them, and uh, I think one of them had a wristwatch, which I also took because I didn't take it. They're gone, so they're back there. I took the heck your wristwatch and pistol. And then I hollered, okay, it's good. So the three crowds go out, and this lieutenant from, from, not, from uh, I don't know whether he was assigned to us or not at that point, but he comes rushing in. And he says, good job, good job. I said, okay. And the phone rings. You know what a field phone is, you know, crank it up and around. So. so he runs over and he picks up the phone. He is a German. He's born and raised, and he knows he speaks the language fluently. So he starts having a conversation with this other pillbox. <laughs> and they want to know his name. And he had a German name. And so he can't think of a German name. Why don't you just give him his? Yeah. So he doesn't. So they hang up on him. So, okay. We know they're still active somewhere there. So then we go out and they have this uh, hillbilly sergeant and I did not like him. He had already shot uh, in a town where the fog was in that we went through after the tanks and everything. Some German came out, German young soldier came out of a house and walked up. And he had the M1 up and he popped him. There was no reason to do that, in my opinion, and I did not like it. So he and I are up, go up on top of this earthen uh, emplacement here, you know, where the, we'd just taken. And we're standing there, and I look over, and here's, mind you, I'm 18. Here's a kid coming. He was, I guess, 16 or something. And he's carrying his rifle like this. You know, here's the sights, and here's the rifle, here's the gun. He's running. You know, you don't care. <laughs> he's running. And he's running toward us. They sent him to see what's going on with the pillbox because whoever spoke to him spoke perfect German, so they had no idea the Americans had got it. So they sent him over to check on it, and he's coming. And I'm watching him, and all of a sudden I hear, what? I look up, and this guy, he's got the, gonna pop him. The same sergeant. I grab, reached up and grabbed that rifle and dragged and I said, you know you could die doing that. And he, did, he didn't like what I said, and he didn't. Give me my gun. I said, you get the hell out of here. So he took his gun and went back down. And he got up there. And when he got up close enough to see, these weren't Germans. This was an American. And I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and I says, come here. 
and he, he's coming up, and I said, gun, and he dropped the gun. So I come up, and he is shaking, just shaking. He is scared to death. So I'm looking at him, and uh, he does, you know, he looks skinny and young. Uniform doesn't fit. I says, hungry? He looks at me, he doesn't know what to say. So I reach and I got a K ration or whatever the hell it was. Pull it up. I open it up and pull the cheese and the crackers out and hand it to him. And he sits right down. <laughs> he was starving. So I forget what was in there. Whatever was in there, I let him finish. And I said, come on. So we got up and I walked back down off the mound and uh, the lieutenant was there, and I says, I got a prisoner. Uh, and he looked at me and he says, God damn, they're getting desperate. You know, say we're. And so then I had the kid, we had some other prisoners, the three that I got from inside, and I think there's some of the others. Had. So he had to go with him. He wasn't going to leave me. He was going to stay right there. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. So he got the idea, and he turned around. He left. So then we moved on, and we see we can. Uh, we had, a, I told you about the Tiger Royale. We had that Tiger Royale one time come out on a field where they were going to have a, a battle. And I think they call those tanks patents. They're high up in the air around, like, you know, nothing compared to a German tank, a Tiger Royale. So anyway, he. Uh, I don't know, like four of them come out. The Tiger Royals, they're going bang, bang, and the, the rest got the hell out of there. They were extremely accurate. They had a longer range gun, that 88. That was very good. Heck, there's something else. I can't remember what else there was. Well, we did have, so then we're in, a, in this town that we've taken over, and they're uh, billeting us, putting us in, in a house. And I've got a house, a, a room on the second floor, small bed, dresser, you know, and uh, we're in this house. The war is still on. And all of a sudden, there's a rifle shot gun goes off, and you hear a lot of hollering. So I go downstairs to see what the heck is going on, and some GI had carelessly cleaned his gun down and he fired a shot. It went, now the way the house was structured, you have your living quarters, and under the same roof is your barn, with your hay loft and your hay, and you know, and he had fired into the hay. So he started a fire. There was a mama, a papa, and a little, and a, like a 13 or 14 year old girl. That was the family unit. And whoa, whoa, they're going crazy. So I'm out there and uh, got my sleeves rolled up because I forget what I was working on. And, uh, you know, it's the house I'm living in. We don't want this to burn down. So, uh, there's a cookie he's going by and he's pulling the trailer with the, with the cans on it, those big cans about this high and they got a handle on each side and they pull the lid off. He's going by so we holler and stop him. So a couple of guys bring the cans over so I take a can and get a, they hoist it halfway up the ladder when I go up the ladder when I get up there. Then I go the rest and put it down. I take the lid off, throw it down, and then I go with the can and I'm dumping the water. And I decide to get go through and make a path. I have no idea why, but I decide to make a path to cut the fire in half. And I do get with that can is like water, and I get pretty good, and I got all the way over there with the water and dumped it, and then I go back down and they give me another can to get it out, take the lid off, throw it down. And this side was burning better than that side, so I take the can and I'm over here, and I get this side out. 
you know, and I got a little water left, so that the, and they get that third can up. And I started pouring it, it looks like chocolate, and I like hot chocolate, you know, it looks like the chocolate they gave you. And I didn't want to use it, but yeah, you know. so I had that. So I put that fire out, and I got maybe a quarter of a can left. So then I sit and wait, and when I see steam or something, I go over and put the water on. And eventually there's, you know, everything's fine. So I take the hand, haul the thing down. I am exhausted. I don't know whether it's the stress or hauling the cans, but I am exhausted. And I get down and uh, <clears throat> all the hair is burned off both arms. All the hair on the side of the head is off. All my eyebrows and eyelashes are gone. And uh, the krauts are, are, come, come over and grab me. I got soot, crap on me, you know, all over. And uh, Mama grabs me. And they, they take me into, and they open the door. We go in their area. And they she sits, sits, has, has me take my clothes, my shirt off. She takes my shirt and my undershirt sitting there, and then she wants my pants and shoes. To I don't want to give her my pants and shoes. <laughs> but, okay, so then I take my, my shoes off and my pants off and my socks, and I keep them short, so I don't know, my shorts ain't going anywhere. But. So she's telling me, and I'm assuming she's saying they're going to clean her or whatever they, they're going to do it. And then she gets a Big pan, and she's got, a, you know, she's scrubbing me, cleaning me up, and she gets me pretty well cleaned up. And then she's going about the eyebrows. <laughs> I'm eyebrowless and eyelidless, and no, I mean, she gets that hair off, you know, burnt, smooth on it. Cleans me up pretty good. And then I, okay, I'm out of there. And I told her, I'm telling her, shoes, only one. Shoes, one. So she got to understand that it's the only pair of shoes. You know, they give you shirts and pants, but they don't give you extra shoes. So man, I haul my butt back upstairs and I flop on that bed, and I no sooner get flat, and the door opens, and this little 13 or 14 year old shuts the door and leans against the door. She's giving me that loving look. <laughs> I sit back up. And I say, too young, out. And she's giving me some, no, too, well, I don't know what else she did, I don't speak to her. I say, out. So she turns around, leaves, closes the door. And I went out like a light and kind of woke up. And it was um, dark. Well, I was hungry. So. Fresh clothes on, went down, knocked on the door, and I needed my shoes. I don't come in, so I come in and I put my shoes on tight. And, and, uh, and I said, Okay, and I left. And I went down to where Cookie had sent up the mess tent. And I walked in, and you ate when the food was served, or you didn't eat. And that was the rule. Okay, so I walked in and Cookie left, looks at me. Is you hungry? Mm -hmm. I said, Star, I'll take care of it. I think he cooked me a pork chop and some. Give me pretty good food. Coffee that he made there, and I ate every bit of it. I mean, he never said a word about, you know, where were you? To, it's that word. And he'd come over and he patted me and said, Good job, good job. And that was it. Cookie. So next day, uh, when I got up, I come down. We're waiting to see where we're going to proceed to, where we're going to move up to. And the German uh, woman, the mother, came out and wanted to see me. So I came in. She had cooked a little cake. And she cut me a piece and gave it to me. It was fabulous. I have no idea. What it was, but it was fabulous, and I ate it. And then I'm sitting in that, and she gave me some coffee. I took one taste of that coffee, and I thought, my God, 
how can people drink this? The chicory, or whatever they use, they're trying to make coffee, and they use chicory, and I don't know, other stuff they make. It's brown, and it's hot, but it's not coffee. <laughs> and so I said, coffee? Yeah, and I said, no, not coffee. Coffee, no, 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 and coffee. And uh, I'm looking around this place, and no food. You know, they just, I'm looking around, so. Cookie watered one of my pistols. So I pick up and I haul my butt down to Cookie. I said, Cookie, I need a slab of bacon, uh, five pounds of sugar, and a, a big can of coffee. What the hell, are you crazy? And I said, no. Nope. And I pulled the pistol out, put it on the table. He says, done. <laughs> <laughs> and he made sure he got a, a bag, a potato bag, to, to cover it. He didn't want anybody seeing that. So I put the potato bag and pretended I, you know, carrying clothes or something. Went back and knocked on the door and went in and I pulled that stuff off and I, the, the, the woman starts crying. I mean, you know, they didn't. I said, no, 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 no crying. And I gave the stuff and I was gone. And then let me see. Now before that, we had actually uh, got into a uh, small area. Change the table. Fifteen. No, I have to change the table. Okay, we'll Good. wait. Good time. <clears throat> so, so anyway, prior to getting into that town, <clears throat> after we went through the, uh, got by the Panzer tank and through that village, uh, then we had to go through another. Uh, they had a lot of woods. Somebody said it was the Black Forest, but. I couldn't tell you. We're going through the woods, and uh, all of a sudden, there's a terrible racket, an absolutely terrible racket. And the lieutenant from New York is panicked, and he went, oh my god, a tank, oh my god, a tank. So brought him back and set him down. When he got him set down, then uh, four of us went up. And we got to an area where there was uh, woods and everything, and all of a sudden there was a cutout, and there was a road that ran along there. And what was making the racket was a horse-drawn uh, uh, cart with a huge soup pan on it. Mm. And you could see bread, and he was apparently so somebody said, Sh I said God, shoot him, let's follow him and see where he goes. So we followed him, we down there, I don't know, just maybe a hundred feet or so, and he pulls into a, like a clearing, and there's six or seven Germans there. <laughs> and they come running up to get the food with this guy in the, in the thing, on this horse-drawn cart. And, uh, so we waited her all up there, getting around, getting, getting food, and uh, have one guy run back, and he got a couple more guys. A couple more guys came up, and we line up so they can see us, and we stand up, and we're all by a tree with a gun pointing at them. Hands a hole. And they got, so it's a little bit of a problem with them. And the guys are trying to get it. So we all slide down and walk over. And these older guys, you know, maybe one guy would be a soldier and some young guy. And the, the guy looks and he's hungry. He didn't say whatever the word is in German, Hungrisch, you know, but you could see, you knew what it was. I said, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> so, so we go around taking the guns away, and I'm going around. Nobody's got a pistol. Nobody's got a wristwatch. Nobody's got anything. So we go around there, and I said, "One of you guys go get the lieutenant and the rest of the guys." So the rest of the guys come up, and uh, they finish eating, which is you know, because they were bent to <coughs> eating. I looked at that soup; it looked more like water to me, but you know, I'm not a soup person. 
like hot water. But the bread was bread, so they ate uh, all the stuff, and then okay, everybody up, and they got up. And uh, the guy's got a horse, and he's got a cart. And I'm looking at him. He's an old farmer. Well, at least he looked like an old farmer to me. He's an old man. It's his horse. So I tell him to take off the shirt because he's got that army shirt on. And when he's got like a t-shirt or underwear under it, actually underwear. So he takes the shirt off, throws the shirt away. And I tell him, go home. Well, he don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I said, how's that? That he understood. How's it? And then he starts talking, which must mean I can go. I said, yeah, go. I'm not going. What the hell would happen to the horse, right? Mm -hmm. The horse would be there. I couldn't. So I said, no, tick, tick, go, go, go. So he's howling, danka, 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 and he's getting the horse, and he goes, turns the horse around through the clearing. And I, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he said, what? I'm telling him his cop, his soup can. <laughs> I'm taking his soup can. He wants no part of that soup can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the bread, yes, he took the bread. And he's smacking that horse, getting it going, he got that horse going. I don't know where he went, he went down the road and out of the way. And we took the rest, you know, up with us. And, uh, had directed them down to a road, and I think one of the guys, until they got to the road, then they walked down the road. It was common to see Germans walking down the road. Mm -hmm. And you knew they were, they'd surrendered their prisoners. And uh, that was interesting. So then in another incident, which I forgot to mention, after I spent the night in the barn, one carried the wounded a GI through the minefield, I spent the night in the barn. Uh, I got out and there were some soldiers behind me, but I didn't see any soldiers around. So I'm walking up this road, and all of a sudden, coming toward me, is three ranks of Prelts with a guy in front. They're marching toward me. So I got my rifle and a sling over my shoulder, and I'm just looking at him. So I move forward, and finally we get there. This guy says something to me in German. He goes like, you know what? He's Sorts or whatever. Comrade. Well, you know, Comrade was surrendering. He's got a whole platoon he's surrendering. Mm. <laughs> the only thing is, they're carrying their guns. Mm -hmm. we, we, I, he's just waiting for orders. That's what to do with the guns, what to do with this, and what to do with that. So I tell him, just straight down the road. <laughs> He'd hollered halt and they'd all stopped very prime and proper. <laughs> These guys look more like the army than the other ones. You know. But there were no SS there. Because the SS won't let them surrender. Wouldn't let them surrender. There were SS there and they tried to back off, they'd shoot. They were bastards. So anyway, he marches by and then I found the unit. So after the incident with the meal wagon truck, we move up to another area. Now we're going into what appeared to be like a headquarter area. You know, and, and uh, we're out there kind of watching and we see these crowds in these open cars, mm -hmm. touring car, driving around officers or whatever. So I said, well, that thing is a little heavily defended mm. for us, you know. We got to get more help here. So he's on the radio talking, and uh, I'm wandering, which I had a tendency to do. So I wander over, and I'm getting away from the guys. I don't know about it. I wander over, wander over, and I get to where a road is, and. Uh, there's traffic on the road. Pretty soon, all the traffic is gone. They went up there. And here comes this touring car. Uh, ha! So when I see the touring car, 
right away, as soon as he gets up close, I step out, put the M1 on him. And we got the, we got the, the driver and we got two off German officers in the back. Hmm. And I said, Halt and Hansa Ho. Well, the driver, he was dead if he didn't, because boom. And neither one of these officers made a move for a weapon. So I said, okay, raus. <laughs> so they all got out of the car, and I see the pistol on this officer. The guy called him General, so I knew he was a general. You know. He was a general. And uh, I don't know what the other guy was. Yet he had a pistol too, so I got the two pistols. And they both had watches. I got the two watches. It was a big day for me. <laughs> Beautiful watches too, you know, this is good. And then I tell the driver to drive the car off the road over there. And he don't want to do it. You don't want to drive a car from him. So he does it. So then I take the uh, driver and the two with me and I walk back to our unit. And uh, tell the lieutenant over here, this, this guy's a general. Meanwhile, the guys are looking at me, they can see it, got the two pistols. So say, Give me one of those, not in your life. Go get your own. So, anyway, then we got the generals, and he gets on the radio and tells them, you know, we got some general. You know. Boy, I liked his uniform. I was going to take his hat, but I thought I'd better leave his hat on him if he's a general. I was going to take his hat. And uh, right away they send, a, send, send somebody up real fast to get those guys. Mm. And haul their butt back. I suppose they want to interrogate them yeah. or something along those lines. So, May 5th, my birthday, they tell us don't <coughs> shoot any more Germans. There has, the war has ended, don't shoot any more Germans, fine by me. And then May 7th they come and said, armistice. Mm. Oh, okay. So now they take us as a group and they bring us down to another uh, area and it's a huge prison camp, fenced in big prison camp and prisoners are coming daily and they're getting out of the things and going into the, into the thing. <clears throat> and so I'm wandering around town and I find one of these open car uh, vehicles that I had the guy drop off the road. Probably they germ drove some officers up and they got out and went in the camp. What was it, do you know? Hirsch. Hirsch? Hirsch. So I get there and it starts. So four of us piling it <laughs> driving around the town and some major goes by us in a jeep and he hollers. So we stop. The jeep backs up and he says, where are you going? Sightseeing, where's your guns? Cardinal rule and they were without a gun. No words. We all pull out pistols and point them at them. <laughs> and our guns! That damn it, you're not supposed to be driving those guns. Give us hell. So we had to try back and put, you know, put the car away. And he told us where to put it. At a motor depot. So we put the car away, we couldn't drive the car. So then we're walking along the fence and I look in. Now, SS, you could see they had a distinctive uniform, and they had the lightning bolts, you know, and they were a different breed of cat. And here's this SS guy, and he's got a pistol on his side. Immediately I put a gun on him. You! You! And he, he comes over and I says, come here. And I walk with him. I walk him all the way down to where the post is, where they come in. I say, this son of a bitch has got a gun on him. And the guy says, yeah, I know, Mick. 
What do you mean? They'll kill him if you don't have a gun on him. I said, what? <laughs> he said, he's SS. Some of these guys would kill him if they get a chance. No, no, he, he can keep his gun. I said, okay. That was one gun I didn't get. Mm. But if I'd had my way, I'd have got that gun. But they left him with the gun. That was it. Then they had, so then they moved us to, uh, I think it was Zimmerzee, Lake Zimmers? Zimmer Z, which is Lake Zimmer. They use a Z instead of the term lake. And we were billeted in this beautiful uh, uh, villa that belonged to some, apparently some general. And uh, it was gorgeous. And I'm looking at the house, and you go in, and then there's windows. You know, there's no door. How, you know, all the house, up, and I go outside, and there's shutters, three windows. That's got to be a room. So since I'm the radio guy, I'm there. And they're taking the details and the other fellas, so I'm alone. So I go out there, and I take care of that, find, figure a way to get the shutter up, and I take a bayonet, and I'm in. I open that room up and I'm in there. He had, you could see the door from in the room. He'd have the door and then he'd plastered and made a wall so that hopefully no one, well, I got in there. <laughs> and there was a lot of stuff in there. There was a nice coin collection, I mean stamp collection. And I stupidly, instead of shipping the books, I was taking the, the stamps out. How dumb. Should have taken the books and shipped the books. But you know, you know I, I should have been smart then. I was 19. So I, and I got a lot of souvenirs out of that. Really nice souvenirs. I got some uh, SS daggers. They hang. I probably should have brought one to show you. And it, it's uh, black and silver, and it's, it's got, it hangs from uh, your belt with a skull and crossbones on. And then there's skull and crossbones plaques and lightning cross, skull and boat lightning cross, like this, and it holds it at your side. Mm -hmm. And you pull it out, and when you pull it out, it says, Mein Er heist Troja. My honor is true. Pretty good stuff. Uh, also, I uh, captured a field surgeon's knife. Now, that's an instrument of torture if there ever was, because it's long, and these cross things are sharp as hell. They saw through a bone. Mm. These, if the foot is blown off, he wants a saw through, he can saw through. And then there's a knife which is sharp, and then the end is dull. So you can hit it and break a bone. Because I didn't know what you know what all that was until I started talking about them and finding out. It's, it's quite a knife. I got that. And some other knives. Got a lot of got a lot of German knives out of that place. And that's So cool. you get home. How do you take care of your High school that you didn't finish. Well, before we get home, a funny incident. Since we were in this uh, area where the, uh, the foothills of the mountains were, and we get in a jeep and we drive up the foothills, and they had some skis there. I'd never skied in my life. And uh, we got up to what looked like a gentle slope. And the one guy could ski, so I got a pair of skis, I put them on. So he says, just go over the edge, and he says, just shift side to side, and you can turn. So I go over the edge. I'm not turning. I'm going like this. Nothing. I'm going to a tree, tree branch, brushes right through the bushes, right through everything. If there was a tree there, I would have met it. And then I get down to the bottom. I said, no more of that. <laughs> but anyway, we drive up in the Jeep, and we drive up there, and a, and a deer walks out. 
I said, hey, some deer meat for cooking. And I pull out my 45, and I go, bang! And the dirt kicks up 10 feet this side of the deer, 45. I said, wow. So I elevate it, pull the trigger, five feet this side of the deer, 45. The only thing in 45 was close up. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't accurate. Oh, I mean, oh, but it wasn't very accurate. Yeah. So then I shifted to a, uh, uh, to the uh, occupation army, stayed there, and I, uh, got assigned to a railroad operating battalion. Hmm. And by then I picked up a few words of German. So I was there and as soon as a German come up to talk to the lieutenant, he couldn't understand it. So he'd holler and I, I would come and I would you know, which means when you want to the German, and then he would have I would somehow figure it out. So then the Germans decided that they better, if they want to communicate with these Americans, they better uh, teach me more German. So then they made an effort and I went with them. We'd go down to the beer hall and we'd have some beer and we'd talk and they would be explaining things to me. And because of my memory, mm -hmm. I was becoming fluent very, very quickly, which just surprised the hell out of me. But they said that was because I was German. Die sind Deutsche, das ist der Name, Herzog. Das warum sie kann so gleich Deutsch lernen, you know, sie kann so easily learn. So then that was what I would do. So I didn't have to go out and check the cars or anything. He wanted me there. So any communication, I was available. And it was nice, it was nice. It was a nice deal, you know. And we were billeted. Uh, in, a, in a civilian dwelling. Um, I, another GI, and uh, I think the family was still downstairs, I think. But then GI was living with some German woman. She was very attractive. But, you know, eventually he's going to go home, mm -hmm. and eventually she got PG. And he left for home. So I was doing fine, but uh, they used a point system to go home. But because of my medals uh, and my time, you got two points if you're in combat, one point if you So because of the point system, I was way, way up beyond being able to go home. So finally, I don't know, I got it some letters from home, come home, you know, this and that and all that. So I told the guy, you know, I'm heading home, and he didn't want me to go, because I was his interpreter, as the Germans say, his dolmetscher. So I said, no, I got to go. So I came and uh, got home, and we disembarked, again, a big troop ship, and again, I headed right for the galley. <laughs> make sure that, but the guy said, no, 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 no returning troops have to serve. So they had made, the Navy had made sure they had enough people to do it. No more of that. You know, kind of a nice thing for us. So we were on this ship and we got home and disembarked in New York, which was interesting. Interesting seeing the pugs, because this was a big, long, I think, ship. And these tugs would come up and shove the front. And they had all these big, huge bumpers on them. They'd maneuver that, and then the guy would... Really can't steer those damn things when you're going so slow. I guess not. Well, he, when he pulled us up, and we're alongside a pier, and they put a ladder down. So then they assembled us in this big hall. I don't know, five or six hundred guys in there. And they're in all in chairs and everything. And they got this guy up in front. And he's telling you the virtues of the Army Reserve. Oh. And how you get credit, you know, you can even retire, you get this benefit and that benefit. And he said, uh, I hope I have enough uh, applications for you guys, he says, but uh, uh, okay, when you're ready, come on up. 
foot or the pin drop. <laughs> Not a chair moved. And we, you know, the, we're veterans. We've been there. You know, we're not getting back in anything. So he said, well, okay, you'll regret this. And he gets up and he uh, leaves and we're free to go. Then we get up then and then we got to get uh, transportation. You got to be taken here and they have a train for you and the train will go back to Detroit, you know, and all that stuff. So that was good. So, we, so I'm back in Detroit. Well, I'm glad to see you. All the folks were there. They were so happy. So I was in one piece. Mm -hmm. The only time I got shot and hit with a gun was we were moving up to an area, and we were in one wooded area, and they had a lot of those in Germany and France. And we had to cross another wooded area, 100 yards of football field or whatever it was. And there were some logs, big logs laying down for whatever purpose. I don't know, maybe they sat on the one that I don't know. But they were laying long. So, oh, that's a good idea. So we can't see anything in the woods there. So I run out and drop down behind one of the logs, and then the other guys start running. Well, when they start running, they, now you start hearing shooting. And then we're all behind the logs. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to get up and run into that woods. You know, because I don't see anybody here. So I put my hand up, ready to pull myself up. Bang! He shot me across my hand. Mm. And it's like you had a finger here, mm. full of fluid. The heat of the bullet seared or burnt the hand, and that, you know, that all full of fluid. Look, look there, right? Fluid. It stung, but it also scared me. For one thing, yeah, it's a good shot. Yeah. A hand, you know, that son of a bitch almost hit it. <laughs> I pull it down and I look at it and then I say, how was my hand up there? And I pretend my hand's in the log so I can see the angle where the bullet is going. So when I see the angle where the bullet is going, I roll out and I Empty the M1 in, put another round in, empty it in again, you know, put another round in, and all over the place there. And then back behind the log and wait. I don't hear anything, so I jump up and run in the woods. Well, fortunately for me, nobody in the woods. <laughs> you know, they'd seen the Americans coming, and I guess they pulled back. Don't know how big the force was or what or who was giving them orders, but oh the Cordig area. When we were moving, uh, when the balls was going on, and these uh, troops were being moved over to the sensitive hot areas, and we were very very thin, uh, that Germans could have walked through, nothing, nobody could have stopped. But to make it look like we had a lot of troops, they would take and put us on a six-by. They would load the platoon up on a six-by. It'd be full. And then they'd drive us to a specific area, stop, we'd get out, we'd fan out, they'd give us plenty of ammo, and we'd move forward and shoot like hell as soon as we made contact. You know, showing the crowds there was a lot of troops there. And then they'd pile us up, we'd go down. We'd do that like three times a night, maybe. Four times, maybe. So the last one we got, we're going to move up with French troops. We're flanked by the, the, we call them frogs. We never had much confidence in them. But they're going to move up with us. So we fan out, I'm on the edge between the frogs. He, he puts me there. So we're moving up. And we move up and we start shooting like hell at the crowds. And the crowds are shooting back. And then all of a sudden you hear these whistle signals. Now, there is no American group I know, at least up till then, that ever used muscle, whistle signals for maneuvers. But they're making whistle signals. And all of a sudden you catch glimpses of the crowds. You know, you try to pop at it and we're still shooting. Trying, and they're moving back. 
all of a sudden there's no crowds in front of us. So then we turn around and we're pulling back and I hear shooting over here. The crowds had pulled off and went over and discovered it was French and they're moving forward because the French aren't shooting that much ammo. They don't have the ammo we have apparently. And all of a sudden the Germans are moving forward and I'm looking at the back of them. And I hear the French shooting and the crowd shooting. Crowds went right through the French usually. Mm. So. so I figure, well, God damn. So I come over and when they get far enough in front of me, I, I empty the, the load, roll, put another, empty the load, roll, up the load, and do that, I don't know, about five times maybe, then come back in the middle and start shooting again. And all of a sudden the whistle signals are going off. <laughs> the whistle signals. The crowds pull back. Mm. We're flanking them, they think. It's just me. But the, you don't know that when you're hearing all the rounds going no. on. So they're pulling back, and so I'm standing kind of sheltered by the tree watching, you know. And uh, they're getting out of there. I'm not going to you know, shoot somebody. In the meantime, all of a sudden, here's something coming up, swinging that gun around. It's a frog, a Frenchman. And he comes and he's looking. And he's saying something to me in French. And I don't know what he's saying. And uh, so I turn around and I say, okay, you go. And I walk. And I can't get rid of the Frenchman. I stopped a couple of times. Can't get rid of the Frenchman. So eventually I get back to the unit. As soon as I get back to the unit, I holler, Frenchie! I said, get this frog off my butt or I'm going to shoot him. So Froggy, who speaks fluent French, goes over and he's starting talking to him. They're looking at me and then looking at the Frenchman and looking at me and looking at the Frenchman. Finally comes over and he says, he says you saved this platoon. I said, he's crazy. I fired a few rounds at the back of the Krauts. I didn't save his platoon. Well, he says you did. He wants your name and number and everything. I says, Tell me to get the hell out of here. He said, no, give it to him. I said, okay, Frenchie. So I go over and pull out my dog tag and he copying it, you know, copying the stuff. And then he gets that old dumpy tag tag away and he steps away and he goes, one of these funny salutes, you know. Right. <laughs> I go, you know. <laughs> and he takes back off. Eventually, I got a corps de guerre. They mailed me a French corps de guerre. 20 years later, maybe. Mm. A friend of mine framed it. I got this little medal that goes with it. I forgot to bring that. What did you call it? French Croix de Guerre. Cross of War. Okay. French Croix de Guerre. Oh, <clears throat> so, uh, oh, I forgot one. Once I, they, uh, I fixed up their, or put the fire out in their house, uh, I would always say okay to them because I didn't know. German, and he'd come and want to do something. I said, no, okay, okay. And come over here, okay, okay. So they start calling me Mickey okay, or hair okay. <laughs> Which amused everybody. But. So then, of course, I'm home. I go back to uh, high school. I take summer school. They won't give me a degree because certain courses are compulsory. So I take those certain courses, and uh, I don't look any different than those kids because, you know, it's only a year different. Yeah. They're on the graduating class, and they, <clears throat> the teacher uh, wants a trilet written. And now, trilet is where the first line in the poem is repeated three times. So I write a trilet, and I give it to her, and she wants to know where I got it from, where I plagiarized it from, and of course that gets me a little excited, so I tell them, you find that somewhere, you front me, otherwise it's mine. And the trilet was, uh, life is but a teardrop in the sea of time man dips his bucket and starts his climb. Some fall and some are tripped. Who knows? 
but the next spill may be mine, for life is but a teardrop in the sea of time. And when this precious fluid is spent, man shall find that there is no class and there is no kind, for life is but a teardrop in the sea of time. And she liked it. Well, you need it. She bought it. She liked it, so then I had to get up and read it to the class, which was, you know, I don't know, interesting. But anyway, uh, I, I didn't have any trouble with that class. And then I got into Wayne University. It wasn't Wayne State then. And uh, I would have the GI Bill, but I was taking extra courses. So I was working. Uh, 58 hours a week in a gas station, and all the courses plus at school, at DCL, which was downtown Detroit then. Now it's up at Michigan State. So uh, I'm going to school, and no problem because of my memory. I was, you know, and I and I would read. I wasn't stupid. I would read, and I never missed a lecture. I could be on my deathbed. I'd be sitting in there making sure, taking notes and taking that lecture. So then eventually I got into law school. And You've been practicing law ever since. Yeah. And you're still practicing law. Yep. I think 60 years this year. Hmm. That's a long time. So I got a lot of souvenirs from there. And this was the, this is the pistol. took from the German. It has, it's inlaid, the general, it's inlaid with silver and it has got ivory handles. It's a Beretta. Top of the line. Beautiful gun. I don't know if it's ever been fired. But, and he didn't like giving that up. <laughs> but he didn't have much of a choice. But that's the prize. And then I got, oh, they gave me a parade and gave me a silver star from uh, capturing that machine gun nest on the on that field and getting the guys off the field. And so they wrote it up and I got a silver star and they gave me a parade. <laughs> and then for going in the pillbox, and uh, getting everybody out of the pillbox, I don't know where this goes, but they gave you a bronze star. <laughs> no parade. Because hmm. when it said you're getting a bronze star, I thought to myself, that was pretty hairy. <laughs> you know, it should have been a silver star too, but uh, what the heck. But no parade. The silver star. They actually had a parade. Where was the parade? Uh, in Germany on some, it was like a, a, a soccer field. And I mean, you know, the regiments there. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty impressive. The, all the officers. When I, wound, I wound up in Heidelberg and they, and they assigned me, because of the medals, they assigned me to uh, driving field grade officers. A field grade officers is, I think, major and above. So I was driving colonels, generals, majors. I would drive them to the Heidelberg restaurant or something, and I would get to eat that food too, <laughs> which was very nice. And uh, then they were closing the Heidelberg off, so then they backed me uh, off to the railroad operating battalion. But Heidelberg was good duty. The Heidelberg Schloss, which means castle, got to see that, and they had the largest wine barrel in the world. It was so large that they had a dance floor on top of it, and you could climb the steps, and they would do the dance up there when they would play, the, you know, the stuff where the Germans are jumping around. I well, thought that was very impressive. And you got the presidential citation. Got a presidential citation, meritorious unit award. Meritorious unit award, combat infantry. Badge, yeah, combat badge. Badge. 
then you spoke about the French. Cordiger, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was good, yeah. Probably there's a citation for my unit uh, that the lieutenant said I got, but I said, I didn't get it. <laughs> the guys were there too. But um, I usually wasn't f afraid for some reason. What, what do you think, I mean, you were so young, what do you think was the difference between you and some of the other guys that, we, that you were just able to stay so clear-headed in some of those? Was there something in your, in your background, in your upbringing, or do you think that's just the way you were born? No, um, I truly think that if you're going to have a soldier for combat, the 18-year-old is the best. <clears throat> As you get a little worldly and get more experience in the world and see all the things that can happen, let me tell you, you get some, t you get a little timid about sticking your neck up. When you're 18, you don't. You keep thinking, this won't happen to me. It, but it seemed that there were a lot of situations where you may have been daring, but you were clear-headed enough not to take reckless chances. You know, that you were able to, for instance, the fire. You know, you seemed like you were very quickly able to say, oh, there's water over here, I can... A cookie take, came by with, yeah, the, with the... Yeah, well, I mean, that was luck, but... Or a but, event. But, I mean, there were other people around, and, and you seemed like you had more clear-headed thinking than, than a lot of them. Was there something in your background? You think that's just the way you were born? I have no idea. I know that uh, the Lieutenant Stanley Pleasant called me up years later. He looked me up. He was also an attorney. He called me up and he got on the phone with me and I didn't know who it was. So I uh, he says, is this Herzog? I said, yeah. And he said, that fearless, crazy, absolutely unbelievable son of a bitch. <laughs> I says, I, I qualify for everything but the, the last part. And he says, Mickey and Stanley Pleasant. But we hadn't been together that much, but, but I remembered it. I remembered and I said, and, and he said, and I'm not holding up a tree. So I remember, eh? I just so see, I it, but I told him you sit there, because he went in, and when he came back, the war was almost over. But I, I liked uh, figuring things out too. I could figure things out in a hurry. What you know, the choice to make, what to do, and and the others caught on to it pretty quick. I mean, look, I'm younger than these guys. And they they want to hear what I have to they want to do what I say or have to hear what I say, which you know is. But when you are somebody's trying to kill you, and you know it, and somebody is giving you is taking kind of charge and saying do this or do that, you're more than happy to go with them. The only time that. that I wasn't running around saying do this or do that. It was after DeSalvo came. When Buck Sergeant DeSalvo showed up, I was a PFC. So DeSalvo, uh, after he joined, the next thing we got into, uh, DeSalvo was kind of taking over and doing this and that. And uh, it was fine by me. Uh, if I didn't like it, I didn't do it. Because, you know, I want to survive, and uh, and then the South will find out pretty quick that, you know, they wanted to listen to me. And the South will find that out a couple of times. When I disagreed with going there, I said, that's too easy to get in trouble. You're exposed, no, no, we're going here, there, and so forth. After a couple of those, so that's why when we got in that town and the radio didn't work, and they wanted to solve it, walk back, he said, give me Mickey. <laughs> so he and I walked back and did, in fact, uh, 
connect up and then we runner brought another radio. How oh, there was you could talk you know forever when you're in combat that long. Because by that time I was getting to be one of the senior people. They were the rest were getting wounded or killed. And if you're surviving you're doing something right as far as I'm concerned. I'm curious, you got a JAG model here, what's that for? Judge, I, the, oh, there was a, uh, when, when I got the Silver Star, uh, the, the commendation, which is the write-up that they rely on, uh, I sent it home to my uh, parents. My dad was commander of the uh, VFW post, VFW post 127. They met at Finkel and Livernois, just down Finkel, and they went around the corner. Uh, so he took the citation to the next meeting. And um, he's getting up and he's reading the citation, but uh, he couldn't make it through it. Oh, that's surprising. He, uh, so somebody else took over and finished reading the citation. Of course, I didn't know that had happened when I got back. And I was wondering why all these people were so darn friendly. Because <laughs> everything that happened, he'd come down and brag. Oh, goodness. Huh. So I got there and uh, <coughs> started attending the meetings. And, you know, I was a member. And I'd take my dad down there all the time. He'd get a little looped up and I'd <laughs> take him home and get him there. And eh, that was nice. Then they made me in whatever that, that is. I think I was a judge advocate group leader for the VFW. Maybe not that post, maybe a group of uh, posts. Yeah. Because, because you were a lawyer. Because I now was becoming a lawyer. I hadn't become a lawyer then. <laughs> but I was in law school. So, so Dad forgave you for not going into the Navy? Well, he had no choice. I had no choice. Oh, he didn't like. But when things start happening, why? Well, you get over that. Well, oh, you could get over it when I start getting medals, and he he liked that because it gave him bragging material. Because some of the other guys had children and you know sons that were in the service. That's an impressive array of. Uh, Medals for someone who's been in the service for less, what, almost a year? Uh, let me see. I got out, well, no, August of 47 would be, uh, no, I got in in the end of 44. So it's almost two years. Fruit cocktail, they call it? Yeah, it was a lot of stuff. I, I, they gave me a uh, occupation medal uh, when I was ready to leave. They had a uh, situation in the yard where a uh, girl was ran over. How the devil this young girl got in the railroad tracks for a train to run over her? Who the heck would know? So anyway, as soon as I came in, the, one of the I came in early usually, and the German come in right away, and he's telling me. By now I'm getting to be able to speak it, becoming fluent. And so I immediately uh, tell him to make sure that no, car, no cars can travel on that track either way. And then as soon as we get a couple of guys in, I take the guys out and I, I tell the, ask the German, don't you have somebody that takes care of dead people? You know, I want, instead of us, and he said, yeah, yeah, and I told him to get it. So the guy comes over, and he's got an old camera, and he's taking pictures. Young girl, and killed her. Got a leg and an arm, and I don't know, looked like she was facing the train. When I ran over her. Mm. Whatever that was, I have, you know, you, you don't know. So then they came, and we detailed the area off. No public, you know, even the workers couldn't come. Mm. Kept them out, and then... They, you know, got the remains up and they 
undertaker or whatever he was there. We were in this town, and the town was called Darmstadt. Now, if you are familiar with German, you know the word arm means poor. The people of Darmstadt had taken the word Darm and they bent the sign till the D came off. So when you walked in there, it said Armstadt. You had to drive, roads had to be created by the Americans to drive through. <clears throat> the British went for a bombing run over Berlin. They had three waves of bombers. As they came back, because Berlin was clouded over and they couldn't bomb it, so on the way back, they picked Darmstadt, which is a uh, recreational, vacational type town. There's no emplacements in it. There's nothing. The British come by and they drop the first load of bombs, massive load. Then they come back in with the third wave of bombers and they drop all the incendiaries and they come back with the third wave of bombers and drop the additional explosives. The town was flattened. Certain areas were just rubble. And on the signs, there'd be a piece of cement block or cement brick or whatever going up, up there, and the Germans would get up and they'd write, they had black paint or something, they'd write the names of all the people that were dead in there. And they'd fill the damn thing up. Hmm. So we weren't too happy with the British, but then some guy said, yeah, but they were shooting those rockets and doing all that too, so I said, okay. And I thought, you know, that was... Well, we thank you uh, very much for coming today. I haven't talked about that in a long time. Mm -hmm. Comes back kind of easy though, doesn't it? No, oh, there's a lot more, but I don't want to be here all day. Neither do you. So you like my, anybody want to look at this thing? That's pretty impressive. You do? It's, it's very attractive. It's inlaid silver. Somebody dug the metal what out. Did, what did you do with the other one? Oh, I got a bunch. I've got two do. Lugers. It's a heavy sucker. I got two Lugers, a, a P3 uh, P, uh, P P yeah, yeah. It's all scrolled. Yeah. If I shine it, the silver shines. It looks like it's got a it looks almost like it's got a dragon on it. Now the snake or something. The, uh, the two Lugers, of course, were nice. But then I got the successor to the Luger, which was the, called the P-38. Uh, it also shoots a 9mm parabellum. <laughs> which, incidentally, by the way, if you went out and looked to see who shoots a, a 9mm parabellum bullet, you'd find the military and all police, most police officers yes, like it. to shoot it. Yeah, he can look at it. For certain. So a P-38 was the successor to the Luger. Mm -hmm. Better gun. Now the Luger's a good gun, but it's got that grasshopper action where it comes up. You can't put your hand on top. No. So the, the P-38 is a 9 meter better parabellum, and I like it better. I've got that, too. Well, we thank you very much. We have a DVD of the interview for you. Dave, want to just pass the DVD over to him? This one, I think that's the one, right? That's it? Yeah. Now you can share that with whomever.